We're going to read this morning, we're in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11. We'll get to that in just a moment or two. Uh, I, don't want to, I don't want to just read the Scriptures first this morning as usual, but we will, of course, we'll be going through, probably going through it nearly verse for verse in just a moment or two. But just whilst you're turning there, let me recap very briefly, very quickly this morning as to where we have come to. We're thinking, of course, still in the journey of the heart. We're looking at, last week, we were looking at what the Lord had to say there in the book of Revelation uh, to the church at Ephesus, Revelation chapter 2 we were in, thinking about the church in Ephesus in particular, and how the Lord Jesus Christ commended them for all of the things that they were doing so well, the things that were in place. He was praising them for their discernment, for their spirituality, for their service, for their sacrifice, for all kinds of things. And then he said, but I have one thing against you. And he accused them of having left their first love. And Jesus says, I know your works. He says, I know your labor. I know your service and so on. He knew because, as we mentioned last Sunday, he is present. He is the one who walks in the church, walks in the midst of the church. We thought about, or we mentioned it just in passing last Sunday, how he is the one who has purchased the church with his own precious blood. He is the one who is committed to building the church. He is the one who is leading the church. Friends, he always leads. And can I say to you today that Christ's leadership is good. His leadership is always good. And the reason I say that is because that is one of the the main principles that the whole Christian faith is built upon. We think about his goodness at the cross of Calvary. We think about the mercy that he has shown through the cross at Calvary. We think about the love that he has demonstrated there. And his, his work is always good. And his leadership is always good. Jesus always uses his power. And I want you to follow me in this. He always uses his power according to perfect love and according to infallible wisdom. His wisdom cannot be improved upon and his love is completely perfect. No one can say, wait a minute, I have a better idea because his wisdom is perfect. It's infallible wisdom. And he leads always according to perfect and complete wisdom. And everything he does is motivated by perfect and complete love. We need to settle that in our minds. We need to settle that truth in our hearts. That's his good leadership. And you see, whenever we are fully appreciative of that, that should make us thankful to him. Whenever we understand that, we want to say to him, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the way he leads us, for the way he guides us, for the things that he does unto us. Motivated always, let me say it again, his power demonstrated, motivated always by infallible, perfect wisdom and by perfect love. Should make us a thankful people. And you see, sacrificial love... And sacrificial obedience is easy whenever it's motivated by gratitude to the Lord for what he has done and for how he leads us. Now, we will only be able to love Jesus according to the measure of our gratitude. Can I ask you today, are you glad you're saved? Are you glad the Lord laid his hand upon your life? Because you can only love him. We're thinking about the heart. We're thinking of this great love relationship that we've been highlighting and trying to to look into over these recent weeks. But we can only love Jesus according to the measure of our gratitude towards him. Now the reason I say that this morning or the reason I want to highlight that fact is because the devil knows that. And friends, we have an enemy today. And his name is the devil. And he knows that we can only love Jesus according to the measure of our gratitude. And so if he can diminish or if he can minimize our gratitude, our love will be cut short 
as well. Do you follow what I'm trying to say here? And so this is one of his tactics. This is one of his, his strategies to minimize or to hinder love by accusing the leadership of Jesus in our minds. You see, we thought last Sunday about how Jesus told the church at Ephesus, you've left your first love. Friends, this is one reason, this is one tactic that the enemy will use to make us leave our first love. And it's how he accuses Jesus' leadership in our hearts and minds. You see, he will tell us that the leadership of Jesus is not motivated by love. And he'll tell us that the leadership of Jesus is not out of infallible wisdom. He will cause us at times in our experience even to question the leadership of Jesus. Have you ever done that in your experience? Whenever the thing wasn't working out the way it needed to work out, whenever the thing didn't come to pass the only way that you felt it should come to pass, have you ever had cause to question the leadership of Jesus? And you see, the enemy will come And he will speak into our minds and he will tell us that we are not getting what we deserve. He will tell you, Jesus is neglecting you. He will tell you that Jesus is ignoring you. He will tell you that Jesus is not giving you what you ask for. That Jesus is not holding up to his promises. And we've all experienced those things in our minds at times. And you see, the reason the devil does that is so that you will be offended. If you're looking for a title this morning, we've talked about the language of the heart. This morning we're thinking about offense in the heart. The devil wants you to be offended at the leadership of the Lord Jesus Christ. And friends, let me say this lovingly. Some believers carry a deposit of defense, or sorry, I beg your pardon, of offense in their hearts. A deposit of offense, and they don't even know it. They're not even aware that it's there. And you can tell, you can tell, well, you know, some, some try to make this very spiritual. And some will say, oh, I can tell, because I can discern that. But I want to just tell it as it is today. You can tell whenever you listen to how people talk. You can tell whenever you listen to how people think. You can tell whenever you listen to how people express their attitude towards the Lord Jesus Christ, whether there's a deposit of offense in the heart or whether there isn't. Now, having said that, let's look at Matthew chapter 11 for just a moment here. We know this story. But I believe in this story, we can so easily miss the real point. We can really miss what's actually really going on here. You see, John in Matthew chapter 11, verse 1, by the way, It came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his 12 disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. That verse actually belongs to the end of the previous chapter. Okay? We know, of course, that the Word of God is inspired by the Spirit, but the breaks of the chapters have been placed there by men. And that verse actually ties in with the end of the previous chapter. So the story that we're going to look at for a moment begins at the beginning of verse 2. And we know this story. John has been thrown into prison. Now, here's the question that I want to leave or want to throw at you for just a moment. Is John discouraged? Is John in doubt? Look at verse 2. Now, when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Why did John do that? John's in prison. Is he discouraged? Let me ask it again. Is he in doubt? You see, I don't believe John's experience in doubt at all in this portion of Scripture. John knows he's in prison. John knows he's going to die. Jesus knows that John is going to die. But John's disciples do not know that John is going to die. And so John sends his disciples to Jesus because verse 2 says in prison he had heard about the works of Jesus. And he says to these two disciples, look, he says, go and ask him. Go and ask him, are you he that should come or should we be looking for another? Now let's get this for just a moment. He has heard that Jesus is exercising the ministry of the miraculous. 
John's entire ministry, John's entire life has prepared the way for this. His whole life had been given. He's the forerunner. Prepare ye, and the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. John's entire life and ministry has waited for Messiah. Has waited for the time whenever the Holy Spirit will come upon Messiah. And this kind of ministry will be released amongst the people. And they come, he sends them away, and they come to Jesus, and they ask them. And you see, Jesus knows exactly what's going on here. He knows all things. All things. And so Jesus sends them back. Look at verse 4 and 5. Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. In verse 4, he simply says, look, go and tell John what you hear. Go and tell John what you see. And then in verse 5, as we read it, Jesus talks about the lame walking. He talks about the lepers cleansed, the deaf hearing, the dead are raised up. Jesus, in verse 5, quotes from a few passages out of the Old Testament that speak specifically about Messiah. You can read about them in Isaiah chapter 29, Isaiah chapter 35, Isaiah chapter 61, amongst others. And Jesus is actually quoting out of these portions of Isaiah that these men would have known. And so these disciples of John, as they see and as they hear what is happening and what Jesus says, you know, I, I, I can picture this. They're so excited They're looking at this. They're looking at everything that's happened. Jesus quotes from these portions of the Old Testament scriptures. And I can see them here. And they're saying, this is right out of our scriptures. Have you ever seen God doing something? And you felt, that's right out of the scriptures. Has has God ever done anything in your life? And you felt, that's just the way the scripture says it would be. Has that ever happened to you? You see, friends, there's something thrilling about that. And these men see this, and they get so excited. It's just as our Old Testament scriptures. I can see them saying, we were taught this whenever we were children being taught in the synagogue. We were taught about Messiah. And now he's quoting out of these passages in Isaiah, and he's working the works that these passages in Isaiah are speaking of. And I can see them here, and they get excited. And they're looking now at Jesus And this is what they're thinking in their hearts. You are Messiah. You are the one that we are to look for. And then Jesus gives them this little point of teaching. Look at verse 6. He says to them, And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Blessed, blessed is he. Whosoever shall not be offended in me. And they're thinking, Lord, why? Why would I ever get offended at you, Lord? Why would I ever be offended towards you? And Jesus has told them, these things are happening. And then he says, blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. Can I ask you today, does Jesus offend you? That's a good question. And you see, you're sitting there right now and you're thinking just the same, no doubt, as these in the scripture. You're thinking, how could Jesus ever possibly offend me? He's my Savior. He died for me on the cross of Calvary. How could I ever be upset? How could I ever feel offended? Towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Well friends there are two reasons that people get offended at Jesus. The first one is this. And I've told you before that Jesus is the wild lover. Jesus is the radical of his age. Jesus is the one who lives always right upon the very edge. There's excitement in Jesus. There's power in Jesus. There's the unexpected in Jesus. He lives right on the very edge of life. He doesn't conform to the way other people say he should do things. 
And to walk with Jesus, to live with Jesus, is a life that's filled with uncertainty. It's a life that's filled with danger. We mentioned that before. It's a life that should be filled with excitement. Because he's the wild lover of your heart and of your soul. And people get offended by him because of two reasons. The first is this, what he does. And the second reason is what he does not do. People get offended for those two reasons. The the way he does things and the way at times he does not do things. You see, sometimes, folks, he doesn't intervene. Isn't that right? Sometimes he doesn't do the things that we want him to do. And sometimes whenever he does do the things that we have been wanting done, he doesn't do them in a way that we find acceptable. Whenever Pastor Hilliard spoke about our our Pentecostal heritage the other night, did he not tell us that towards the end of the, the 19th century, people were praying for revival? And whenever God came and poured out his spirit and Pentecostal phenomenon began to rise again, that some of the very people who had been praying for revival didn't like what they saw. They were offended. They didn't even believe it was of the Lord. And you see, folks, Jesus does stuff like that at times. He does stuff like that. And so we can get offended by what he does, and there's times we get offended by what he does not do. Because he doesn't always answer that prayer the way you hoped he would answer it. He doesn't always intervene in that situation the way you expected him to intervene. And you see, in this story here, in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus in this story is not going to intervene. And John is going to be killed. And John's disciples are going to have to struggle with this issue of offense being offended at Jesus. And so they go back to John and they tell him what they have seen. They tell him what Jesus has spoken. They tell him what they have heard. And and I, I, I can see John listening to what they're telling to him, what they're saying. And then John, he looks at them and he says, I can imagine, he looks at them and he says, did Jesus say anything else? Did he tell you anything else? And they think for a minute or two. And then they say, oh yes, yes, yes. He said something. He said something to us that was a bit strange. Because he said to us that we would be blessed if we weren't offended at him. But what a strange thing that was to say to us. Because we would never feel annoyed. We would never feel angry at Jesus. Why would he say something like that? We would be blessed if we weren't offended at him. And I can imagine John, it's not in the scripture, forgive me here, but I can imagine John thinking and I can imagine John saying to them, look, you remember, you make sure you remember what he told you in that little thought. And you see, John was trying to stabilize his disciples because they were about to face the crisis of their lives. Their leader, John, The one whom they were following. Their leader John. What a crisis because John is about to lay down his life for the cause of Jesus Christ. And you see how they would handle that was going to determine how they would relate to Jesus from that time forward. Do you follow what I'm trying to say here? How they would handle that crisis. And you know you can't help but look at John in this story. What a shepherd he is. What a heart he has for those whom he's been teaching. What a heart he has for those who have been following after him. It's the true shepherd's heart. And he's preparing them for the inevitable, which lies just ahead of him. And it's going to be the biggest crisis in life that they have ever faced, because he's going to be gone. He's going to be gone. Now let's read on for just a moment. Verse 7. As they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind. You see, we come back to Jesus in the story now. And Jesus knows that the crowd who were there at that time, whenever John's disciples came to question about this, 
Jesus knows that the crowd was going to misinterpret this whole thing. And you see, Jesus is completely committed to John. Completely committed to him. But the crowd think that because of the question that these disciples ask, the crowd, they're thinking that John is wavering in prison. But he's not. And so Jesus asks the crowd here, according to verse 7, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? He says, do you think John is bending like a reed under the wind? Do you think that John is wavering under pressure? You see, friends, the words, the words, the winds of, of persecution, they don't move John at all. John is completely committed to the Messiah that he has heralded to the nation. Completely committed. And Jesus says, do you think John's wavering under pressure? Look at verse 8. But what went ye out to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. Jesus says, did you go out to see a man in soft garments? They live in palaces. Do you think John is a man of comfort? Is that what's on John's mind? Comfort? Is he fearfully trembling like a broken reed? Or is he longing for comfort? Is that what you're thinking because of this episode? You see, if John had wanted comfort, all that John had to do was be quiet. The Bible tells us Herod actually liked John. And if John had just been quiet, Herod would have been good to him. He probably could have visited the palace on occasions if he just had kept his mouth closed. But you see, John wasn't interested in that whatsoever. He wasn't interested. In fact, John is the greatest man, Jesus says here, ever born. There have been many martyrs. Look at verse 11. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. There have been many martyrs, but Jesus says John's faith more than measures up to any of them, more than equals any of them. He's not wavering under pressure. He's one of the greatest men who has ever been born. But you see, John was concerned that his young disciples were not going to be shaken because this tremendous crisis was about to be unleashed upon their lives. And they must not be shaken by offense in their relationship to Jesus. You see, friends, that's a a much more serious thing, to be shaken by offense towards Jesus. Because if we get offended by Jesus, we cannot grow in heart love towards him. That's why people don't get saved. Because Jesus offends them. People don't want to have to bow the knee before the cross of Calvary because the thought of having to do that offends them. They get offended by Jesus and show there's no love in their hearts because we have this thing built into us whereby we think, well, I'm such and such and I'm good enough and I'm this and I'm that and I'll do this and I'll do that and I'll be good enough. But Jesus cuts across all of that and he says, no, you're lost. And that offends people. And he says, look, you've got to tell. You've got to repent of your sin. You've got to confess. You've got to ask forgiveness for your sin. And that's the only way into heaven. And friends, that offends people. And so there's no love in their hearts. In the midst of God's people, there are people who face situations in life. And because Jesus hasn't done certain things, they're offended at him. And their love doesn't grow. There are other people amongst the people of God and whenever Jesus puts his finger upon something in that life and just like he did in the book of, or, or, to the church at Ephesus and he says, look, you're going great but I have something against you and you need to repent of it. And you see, sometimes whenever he does that in our lives we're not happy about that either and we get offended by him. You see, you see where I'm coming from here? And if we're offended by the Lord Jesus Christ our love cannot grow the way our love needs to grow. And it's a very serious thing because, friends, listen, the devil knows that if he can hinder your love, if you can get offended at Jesus, he can hinder 
your love. And so let me say it again. He wants to accuse Jesus in our minds in the way that Jesus treats us personally so that we'll get offended. Now let me ask you the question again this morning. Is there any offense in your life towards the Lord Jesus Christ? And oh, listen, folks, listen to me. We'll never admit it. Certainly not publicly. But sometimes what we confess publicly and what's really deep down in there can be two completely different things. And you know how you stand today. If there's any offense in your heart towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, his leadership is good. He always uses his power according to infallible wisdom. It can't get better than what he thinks. And he always demonstrates his power or lack of using his power according to perfect love because he leads and he guides and his leadership is always good. And so we've got to be careful about this whole thought of offense. You see, we can't grow, let me say it again, we can't grow in love. Nor can you possibly testify of that love or express that love of Jesus to others properly if you aren't fully appreciating it in your own life. If you're not fully at ease with it in your own experience. How are you going to be able to speak to others effectively if you in your own life, because of offense, if you are struggling personally with the leadership of Jesus in your experience. And so we've got to deal with this offense issue. And this is one of the tactics the devil uses. Ephesus had left their first love. And people leave their first love for many reasons. But this is one reason that they leave first love. Now look at what Jesus goes on to say here. Look at verse 12 for a moment. He says, From the days of of John the Baptist until now, The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Jesus gives John, and he gives John's days as a model of spiritual violence. Now, John is not a a physically violent man. That's not what Jesus is speaking about here. He's not a, a physically violent man. But John here is a model of spiritual violence. He's a spiritually violent man. What do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? He's a man who has been determined that nothing was going to prevent him from being all that he could be for Christ and for his kingdom. Even sacrifice, even martyrdom was not going to stop him. He was going to give his all for the Lord Jesus Christ. He's a a prototype, if you like, of how we are to live. He lived completely surrendered to the Lord, completely surrendered to the will of the Lord, whatever that will would be in his life and ministry. And he was completely committed to serving his Messiah. In other words, he violently withstood anything in his heart and anything in his life that sought to prevent him or stop him from fulfilling his life's purpose. And you see, the thought in this verse, from the days of John the Baptist on till now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. The thought in this verse is a city that's under siege. It's as if the kingdom of heaven is under siege. And in John's day, he He wasn't prepared to allow anything. He violently withstood anything that would hinder him being his very best for the Lord. And also in John's day, whenever he preached, the people flocked to hear him. They pressed in to obey the claims of the kingdom. Just the way an army presses in to invade a city, trying to get inside the walls. And you see, the same was true of Jesus whenever he preached. Whenever he preached, whenever he taught, whenever he proclaimed the truth, the people flocked to hear and to see him. They pressed in upon him. Remember the woman with the issue of blood? Listen, she broke every rule in the book. She shouldn't even have been amongst the people. Ceremonially, she was completely unclean. But she was taking the kingdom of heaven by force, by violence. Nothing, no one was going to stop her from touching Jesus. 
She had tried everything else in her life. Her condition got worse. Her finances were depleted. Jesus had the answer to her need and nothing was going to stop her. She was going to press in just to touch the hem of his garment. And you see, she wanted from Jesus what only Jesus can give to her. And nothing was going to make her stop short of getting what she needed and what she wanted Jesus to bestow upon her. Can I ask you today in your Christian life, do you feel like that? Friends, I have to ask myself, do I feel like that? Well, I will stand against or stand up against everything that hinders me in my life. Will you do that? Will we as a church do that? Because that's what it means to take the kingdom of God by violence. To be violent towards every opposition that stops us from pressing right in and receiving from him everything that he has there available to us. Because that's how we should feel about the kingdom and about our king. You see, there's no place for comfort. John wasn't a man in soft clothing. There's no place for comfort in the kingdom of God. In fact, it says, woe unto them that are at ease in Zion. There's no place for being lethargic. There's no place for being indifferent. There's no place for being apathetic. The problem with our day and the problem with church is that is how so many believers live their Christian faith today. In the lap of luxury, in the lap of comfort. Don't, don't, Touch my comfort. Don't disturb my lethargic attitude. Don't ask me to feel different about my indifference. Don't demand me to shake off my apathetic behavior. I just want to stay pathetic. Because folks, that's the way the church is today. There's no fire. There's no excitement. There's no expectancy to be living on the edge with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's just come and let's just go and let's just keep it the way we're comfortable with. You see what I'm saying here? But that's how the church mainly lives a Christian life today. And don't touch it. Don't try to interfere with it. Don't interrupt it in any way. Let's just stay pathetic. And the world goes to hell. While we be pathetic in our lives and in the church and in our service and in our witness for Jesus Christ. Because we're not pressing in, standing against everything that would seek to keep us out of the kingdom of heaven. And yet it's all available to us. In verse 11 here, Jesus says, John is the greatest amongst the old covenant of the law And of the prophets. Verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now. The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. And the violent take it by force. Verse 13. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. Jesus says John is the greatest. Amongst the old covenant. Of the law and of the prophets. And what an example he sets for us. But then Jesus goes on. And he says in verse 11. Now that the kingdom of heaven, now that the king has come, even, listen to this, even the least amongst us should be greater than John. Now let me ask you again, what is your commitment like to the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you pressing in violently against the works of darkness in your heart that are struggling in your life against your heart? Are you pressing in against the works of darkness that are trying to keep you out of the riches of the kingdom of heaven? Are you trying to take the kingdom of heaven by violence the way John did? Because we're supposed to be greater than him. The least amongst us is to be greater than him. Greater in faith. Greater in understanding. Greater in love. Greater in relationship to Jesus. Greater in service. Greater in obedience. Greater in commitment. Greater in power. Greater in violent determination. Yes. Yes, and greater even in sacrifice. In sacrifice. So friends, why are we like this? Why is the church today 
the way the church today is. Are we offended at Jesus? Are we? Maybe because, as I've said, he doesn't do what we wanted him to do. He didn't bail us out of that situation. Or maybe because we're afraid of what he might do or the way he might decide to do it. You see, the devil will tell us that his leadership is not good. In John's gospel after Jesus, let me finish very quickly. In John's gospel after Jesus rose from the dead, he walked through the wall into the room, or he appeared in the room, whatever way he did it. And he said to the disciples, in fact, on the second occasion he came, remember, Thomas wasn't there the first time. And on the second time this happened, Jesus appeared to them in the room, and he looked at Thomas in particular, and he says to Thomas, touch me. I'm flesh and bone. He wasn't a spirit. He had a body, some kind of glorified spiritual physical body. And John made this amazing uh, statement to him, or confession. He says, my Lord and my God. And Jesus in that chapter of John comes out with this tremendous statement. He says, you know, he says, you believe because you have seen me. Listen to this. He says, but blessed are they who have not seen and have believed. And I know we can attach that to the cross. We haven't seen him physically the way they saw him. But friends, I also believe it it speaks about his leadership. You see, you and I don't know why he does the things he does. We don't know why he doesn't do some of the things we expect him to do. But here's what he's saying to you and me. We're blessed if we believe it anyway. In spite of the fact that we haven't seen it yet. We're going to be blessed. Now, whenever the devil comes to your life and the devil tries to tell you that Christ's leadership is not good, let me give you a verse that you can use with great authority over the devil. I'm going to read it to you. It's Psalm 106, it's verse 1. And the psalm simply says this, Praise ye the Lord. O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Whenever the devil comes to you, he'll accuse the leadership of Jesus in your heart. It's not good. Well, here's a verse that says it is good. Give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Friends, everything he does is good. Everything he does not do is good. Everything about his leadership is good, as we've already expressed. And the devil will say to you that his leadership is not good. Listen, use the word of God. Hit him back with the word of God. The Lord is good. And the devil then will change his tactic because he'll say to you, if he cannot get you to get offended at Jesus, he'll say to you, then you're not good. And he'll say, oh yes, fair enough, his leadership is good. And his promises are sure. And he has got power. And he can do exceeding abundantly above all that you could ask or think. But he's not going to do it for you. Because look at your life. Look at the things that you're contending with in your experience. And you see, if he can't accuse the leadership of Jesus in your heart, he'll accuse you in your heart. You know, the Bible tells us he's the accuser of the brethren. Isn't that right? And the wonderful thing about it is this. Friends, often the way he accuses us is dead right. Isn't that right? We're all too aware of what we are within. We're all too aware of the things that we struggle with in life that are anti-Christ and anti the kingdom of God. And if the devil can't get you to, to come against the leadership of Christ, he'll get you to come against yourself. But again, this little scripture is a glorious thing. Because this little scripture says, Praise ye the Lord, O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. You see, there's nothing in your life and there's nothing in your heart that his mercy can't overcome. There's nothing in your life, there's nothing in your heart that his mercy can't outrun because his mercy endures forever. And so the devil will come and he'll seek to accuse him. If we overcome that, he will seek to accuse us. But the word of God declares... That Jesus' leadership, Jesus' person, Jesus' works, Jesus' love, Jesus' wisdom is always good. 
And no matter how we may feel about ourselves, if we have been washed in the precious blood of Jesus, praise God, his mercy outlasts everything that will be alien in our hearts to him and in our lives to him because he just loves us. You follow what I'm trying to say here? And you see, friends, the Bible tells us that he is coming again. We know that. And sometimes we put that in the back burner. But the Bible says that everyone who has this hope in them purify themselves. It's a purifying hope, waiting for that blessed return and appearing of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who change these vile bodies like they'll be fashioned like unto his glorious body. We're going to spend all of eternity with him. And the wonderful thing about it is this, whenever all is said and done, no matter what you or no matter what I have been called to go through for him, we may be called to lay down our lives. Who knows where that might take us to? But we have got to be those people who will Stretch towards the kingdom of heaven. Stretch towards our Savior with violence to pursue and to grasp everything that he is for us. And if it means tremendous sacrifice, even the ultimate, friends, we are going to be with him for all of eternity. And around that throne, I don't know what we're going to be doing for all of eternity, but one thing I do know that we will be doing Around that throne, we are going to be praising him for his goodness, for his love, for his good leadership, and for the fact that he is always good and his mercy endures forever. And although we don't see the end right now, and although we go through things right now that we can't fully understand, what are you doing now, Lord? There's stuff we don't understand. But although we don't see it all now, there's coming a time when around his throne... All is going to be revealed. And you and I, with all of the the myriads of those down through the years who have been saved, we're going to declare this glorious truth. Praise the Lord, for he is good. And his mercy endures forever. And so I'm asking you today, how do you stand? The time's gone, the time's finished. But how do you stand with him? Are you offended by him? Are you afraid of what he might do in your life? Are you afraid of what he might do in the church? Are you offended by him because there's been something in your life, some experience, some relationship, I don't know, something, and it just hasn't worked out the way you thought it would work out? Jesus says in that little verse that we're blessed if we don't get offended with him. Oh, friends, let's make sure at all times that our love for him is as it should be. He should be the fairest of 10,000 to our souls. And his leadership and his works, they are always good. And even at those times whenever he doesn't intervene, nevertheless, he's still 100, I 150%, 200% completely committed to you and to me just as committed to us as whenever he laid down his life for us upon the cross of Calvary. And so let's not allow the devil to use this in any way to offend us towards our Savior, to diminish our love and to hold us back from pressing in to be with him and to experience in him everything that he wants us to experience. Father, we give you thanks today. We thank you for your word, Lord. The Lord is good. Your mercy, your mercy, Lord, endures forever and forever. And Lord, you know our hearts here today. You know each person. Lord, you know the feeling in every heart right here, right now, at this moment in time. Lord, should there be anyone in this place today offended? Maybe someone not saved, Lord, because of offense. We pray you will make that right in that heart. If there's someone, maybe someone of your people, or maybe more, who feel offended towards you, touch our hearts, Lord. Help us to release that. Lord, sometimes 
Lord, you bring these things before us that our hearts, what's in our hearts can rise to the surface, that it can be cleansed, that we can be renewed in you. And so this morning, Lord, we commit your word to you. We commit every life to you. And we pray, Father, in Jesus' holy name, have your way in us, Lord. And lead us forward with yourself. Cause us to know greater love and cause us to lavish greater love in our witness and our lives and in our service for you. Because, Lord, you are worthy. We ask it, we give you thanks. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen.